Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Prep Well Podcast. In today's episode, I'm going to discuss the chances of your child using their sport as a way to get into a college of their choice, either by scholarship or partial scholarship or no scholarship, and how to increase those chances. I'll go through a variety of sports and how they might help or hurt or be neutral in your child's quest to use sports as their competitive advantage in college admissions. Unfortunately, if your child is already a sophomore or junior or senior in high school, this advice may be a bit too late. Or maybe you've figured all this out already, and your son or daughter is on their way. Most kids start playing sports at a pretty young age. We're talking five, six, seven years old. And this is a great thing. I'm a huge fan. Sports encourage kids to get outside, to make friends, to learn life lessons, and to compete. However, most parents with five, six, and seven-year-olds don't think too much about which sports might be the best for their kids. They typically just sign them up for whatever they see advertised locally, whatever other parents are doing, or what they see on Facebook. And so their child's participation in certain sports just happens. In fact, most parents choose sports that are convenient, close to home. Maybe their child's friends are playing that particular sport. They're easy to play for beginners, or they're just traditional things to do. The usual suspects, depending on where you live, are soccer, baseball, and basketball. So let's start there. What kid did not play soccer for a season or two from a very young age? It's almost mandatory for any young kid interested in sports. Now, why is this the case? Well, soccer can be started from very young. It's social. Nobody's all that good in the beginning. So even the most unathletic kids can blend in. And I'm sure you've experienced watching that beehive of kids just following the ball around kicking the ball erratically in any direction they feel like it. It's complete chaos. But everybody's in the same boat together. It seems like the thing to do on a Saturday morning. And you feel like part of the team. So you bring the sliced oranges and the Capri Suns, and you sometimes suffer through it. For years often. And then you blink your eyes, and six years have gone by. Your child is now 12, playing year-round on a competitive club team, you've seemingly spent tens of thousands of dollars, and every weekend is booked with tournaments, some close to home, some far away, and your child actually seems to be pretty good. Now, you admittedly aren't paying that close attention, but they seem to make the all-star team every year, and they always seem to be angling to get onto an even better or more elite club team year after year after year, And frankly, you're just happy that they found something that they're passionate about and they've made friends and you become friends with the parents of the other players and it's all good. And you may even have a little voice inside your head saying, hey, my kid's pretty darn good. If he or she keeps up on this trajectory, they're bound to get one of those collared scholarship thingies someday, which will make all of this time and effort and money and sacrifice worthwhile, right? So you keep feeding the machine and buying the cleats and the new duffel bags and a new ball and the new jerseys, and you keep making the weekly trips to the tournaments. Until sophomore year in high school comes around and your child doesn't make the varsity team. And this becomes a real eye-opener, a real reality check, because the best kids usually make varsity as sophomores. And of course, there are all kinds of excuses for why this is the case. So-and-so made the team instead of me because their parents are tight with a coach. Such-and-such player gets private lessons from the coach, so the coach wants to keep that relationship intact. And the list goes on and on and on. And it's about this time when it begins to dawn on you that your child's ticket to college on a soccer scholarship does not seem like such a given after all. Either they weren't as good as you thought they were, based on all the all-star teams they made or the feedback from their coach, or the school team is super competitive, or the club team is super competitive, 
or the competitive landscape out there was just way more intense than you could imagine. Or your child maybe is just burned out. Either way, soccer turns out to be a dead end, and now you're scrambling for your child's second act. And meanwhile, it's getting exceedingly late in the game. The same goes for basketball. It seems so innocent at first. Every kid can play. The rim is lowered so that even the most unathletic player can get close to making a basket. In the early days, nobody's allowed to guard anyone too closely so that everybody has a chance to dribble around and feel cool. And just like with soccer, this fiction lasts for a few years before it gets more competitive. And by age 10 or 11, many parents find themselves on the basketball train. Year-round play, weekend travel, constant upgrading to bigger and better club teams, and spending what seems like thousands of dollars on sneakers alone. And before you know it, they're on the AAU circuit, you're paying handsome sums of money to fly them all over the country to play, and then, lo and behold, sophomore year comes knocking, and if your child is not exceedingly talented and blessed with good metrics i.e. height, athleticism, length, quickness, and invited to play on the best AAU team in the area, they can meet the same fate as the soccer player. They fail to make the varsity team, or they do, but they don't play. And after dedicating the last 10 years of their life to the sport, their prospects for playing in college, let alone getting a scholarship, they seemingly dim overnight. And that's a tough pill to swallow. And how about t-ball? The precursor to baseball, our nation's pastime. What could be better than a morning on the baseball field with 37-year-olds who have the attention span of a fruit fly? You guide them to home plate. You delicately balance the ball on the tee. They get to take as many swings as needed to make contact and then you see them run directly past first base into the outfield. Now, that might be cute if the games didn't last three or four hours every Saturday morning, but you persevere because you're a parent and baseball is what little kids like to play when they're young. But if you're not careful and you blink, your child may end up like many soccer and baseball players. They make the all-star team, they're constantly upgrading from club team to club team, They play in tournaments every weekend during the summer. They own multiple $400 bats until they become sophomores in high school when they realize that other kids can throw in the mid-90s and bat in the 400s. And some are actually being drafted into the major leagues as seniors in high school, and that's not them. They're just not competitive at the college level. And so they drop the sport. Or they just play recreationally for the last two years of high school. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Now, I know this is probably feeling like a cynical take on youth sports and college recruiting. And I know there are some standout athletes who prove these scenarios wrong. But unfortunately, they are in the small minority. I have heard the identical soccer, baseball, and basketball story from hundreds of families over the last eight or nine years. And it's not pretty. And unfortunately, most of these athletes and their parents never saw it coming because they never listened to a podcast like this or had any idea what they were up against. They just got swallowed alive by the machine. And they were then spit out by 10th or 11th grade. And that's what I hope to change. My goal in this episode is to make sure that you, as a parent, are paying attention to what's going on with your child as it relates to sports, starting at a very young age. Because in most cases, unfortunately, you can't just set it and forget it. Because once your child gets too far down the line, it's often too late to turn that train around. As a parent, you are the one that sets the train in motion. And if you are not diligently monitoring and assessing with brutal honesty where the train is going and where it will end up, don't be surprised if it goes off the rails. 
at about sophomore year in high school. So what's a parent to do? Number one, pay attention and get educated. Pay attention to what sports you get your child involved in and understand the competitive landscape of that sport. Try not to blindly sign them up for the most convenient sport without thinking about where it might take them. Now, some of you may be thinking that I'm overthinking this or I'm over-engineering this, and that's okay, but others will heed my advice. My thought is that parents should be intentional about which sports they introduce their children to, if they want to optimize outcomes, of course. And there are no guarantees, but you may be able to put a thumb on the scale. These days, sports have become so important in the world of college admissions, for better or for worse, that a decision that you make when your child is seven or eight years old may be far more consequential than what they get on their SAT. So assuming that you as a parent think that sports might play a role in your child's college plans 10 years down the road, what should you consider before registering your child for sports? Number one, is your child athletic? Most parents can figure that out by the time their son or daughter is six, seven, or eight years old. Number two, does your child show any interest in the sport that you're considering? Number three, Does your child demonstrate any natural talent in the sport? Number four, what metrics will your child have? Here we're talking about height, weight, handedness, speed, vertical jump. Number five, where do you live? Do you live in a hot spot for a particular sport or not? Number six, do you have the money to underwrite participation in the sport at the highest level? Number seven, how competitive is the sport you're considering? Number eight, how many kids play the sport nationally? Number nine, how many colleges recruit for the sport? Number 10, is it a sport that offers scholarships to college, either full or partial? And do these scholarship opportunities matter to you? As we've talked about many times, very few sports even offer full ride scholarships. Number 11, if it is a sport that doesn't provide scholarship opportunities, for example, Division III schools and Ivy League schools, maybe they offer admissions preference that might be very helpful down the road. Number 12, is it a common sport or a niche sport? If it's a common sport, you better be elite. And if it's a niche sport, like a squash, for example, you better have a lot of financial resources to throw at it. Number 13, does your sport require a commitment after high school? Like ice hockey, for example, where most players need to play for a year or two after high school to get the attention of some of the better ice hockey programs. So let me give you some practical examples. No matter how much your son likes basketball, If they're going to struggle to get to six feet or six one, and they're average athletically, they should probably think twice about going all in on basketball. It's just the reality of how competitive the sport is. These days, there is such a premium in basketball on metrics, size, height, length, athleticism, that you're almost done before you start if you're not going to be in a six three, six four, six five and up category. There are high-level high school basketball players who are 6'9 and 6'10, and they're not even getting scholarship offers. And with the advent of the new portal system, which allows current college players to make themselves available to be recruited by any college at any time with no loss of eligibility, many college coaches say that they'll never recruit a high school player ever again. They prefer to recruit a player out of the portal who's played in college for a year or two, who's a known entity, as opposed to taking a bet on an unproven high school prospect. And while we're on the topic of metrics, let's address the issue of height straight on. There are some sports where height is a distinct advantage. So if your child has the genes to be on the taller side, 
In this case, I'm talking for males, 6'6", 6'7", 6'8", 6'9", females, 6'1", 6'2", 6'3", 6'4". You may want to gently steer them toward the following sports, basketball, volleyball, crew, water polo, baseball, especially as a pitcher. If they project to be this height, why spend too much time playing soccer or lacrosse or football or hockey, where this type of height will not necessarily be an advantage and sometimes can be a disadvantage? And yes, I get the argument that playing multiple sports from a young age can be advantageous and that specializing too early isn't always the right call, but at some point, you might want to point them towards something that takes advantage of their God-given gifts. What about sports that are better for shorter athletes? I'm talking for males, 5'7", 5'8", 5'9", maybe up to 6'1", 6'2". For females, a couple inches below that, we're talking 5'5", 5'6", 5'7". These are sports like soccer, lacrosse, wrestling, diving, gymnastics. These are sports that give advantage to smaller body types, where you can be crafty and quick and elusive with a very low center of gravity. Why not play to your strengths? What about sports that are good for athletes somewhere in between the extremes of tall and shorter body types? Some would argue that the optimum height for an all-around athlete is probably 6'4 for a male and maybe 5'9 for a female. This type of athlete can probably play every sport, but these particular sports are great for a medium height athlete. Football, baseball, rugby, ice hockey, field hockey, tennis, golf, swimming, track. Now, there are other metrics to consider besides height, such as body type. If your son is 145 pounds and drinking multiple protein shakes every night, struggling to gain a pound or two, Football is probably not a great bet. If, on the other hand, your son is 14 years old and 215 pounds without really trying too hard, you might be barking up the right tree when it comes to football. If your daughter has a vertical jump of 42 inches with great eye-hand coordination, volleyball would probably be a good bet. If your son projects to be 6'6 and is left-handed, then sticking with baseball is probably a good idea, especially if he's a pitcher. If your daughter is finished growing at 5'4 and is highly coordinated and fearless, then maybe gymnastics or diving is a good fit. If your son doesn't have height or size or specific traditional athletic skills, how about wrestling? In wrestling, height doesn't matter. It's weight that matters, and weight can be a great equalizer. In wrestling, other skills come into play, like toughness and endurance and technique and work ethic and aggressiveness. What about geography and politics? These days, depending on where you live and the future of transgender policies in different states, I'm not sure I would encourage my daughter to swim or run track. Most of us have heard the stories of young female athletes having their hopes and dreams dashed by getting trounced by transgender female athletes. Do you want to pour a lot of energy and time and money and aspirations into a sport that will ultimately be dominated by transgender athletes? I would think twice. What about the competitiveness of certain sports? Sometimes competitiveness is driven by the sheer number of kids who play the sport, like basketball and soccer, where they number in the tens of millions, or by whether or not there are scholarship opportunities in college or professional opportunities after college. Ever wonder why girls' volleyball is so expensive and so intense? Probably because it's a headcount sport or a scholarship sport which means colleges can actually offer girls full-ride athletic scholarships. This can be a big incentive to stick with a sport, spend a lot of money, and go for it. And thus, volleyball becomes super competitive. 
does your daughter have good metrics for volleyball at their position, enough to compete against others who are gunning for those scholarships? What about proximity to certain sport hotspots? If you live in Nebraska, for example, I'm not sure you want to pin your hopes and dreams on playing lacrosse in college. Not that you can't become a great player, but given that lacrosse is not particularly popular in Nebraska, it would likely be hard to find good enough competition over time to be ready for the players who come from Maryland and Long Island, New York, who've been sleeping with with lacrosse sticks from age three. Where you live may dictate the type of sports you might want to focus on. If your child is a standout swimmer who wants to give water polo a try, even if they have metrics, meaning height or left-handedness, if you don't live in Southern California, you might want to reconsider. Yes, there are some pockets of the country where water polo has been gaining popularity, like in Connecticut and Texas, but by and large, the Mecca is Southern California. Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, Mission Viejo area. That's where the culture is. That's where the competition is. That's where the best players come from, typically. And that's where coaches typically recruit from. That's not to say that it's impossible to become a highly recruited water polo player from a Colorado or a Kansas. But remember, we're trying to maximize our chances. There will always be a one-off or an edge case here or there. But if you're playing the odds, they wouldn't be great. And don't forget the distinction between team sports and individual sports. Each has their pluses and minuses. For individual sports like track, swimming, golf, tennis, there are published times or handicaps or national rankings that you must reach to be competitive. Some kids are better when they have a specific goal like this in mind. Some kids are better when they're playing by themselves. Others might be better suited for team sports. On team sports, however, it's important that you get on the right team and that your team gets exposure and that you're good enough to perform well on that team. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all the factors to consider when sizing up what sport your child might have the best shot at excelling in. I tried to hit some of the highlights, but there's also coaching and parental involvement and resources available to you, regional reputation for certain sports, and, of course, your child's interest in any particular sport. You can go through this checklist and find the perfect sport in the perfect region with the perfectly aligned metrics, only to find out that your child has no interest in the sport. As I said from the beginning, this can be a very difficult needle to thread. My point in going through this exercise is not to freak you out, or convince you to move your child from sport A to sport B. It's simply to raise your awareness about what the long-term consequences may be of your child playing certain sports, especially as it relates to college recruitment. I know from personal experience, as well as from working with hundreds of families, that many parents don't pay any attention to these things in the beginning. Those early parenting days are often spent in survival mode, and if a t-ball or a soccer registration email shows up at the right time, you register your child and move on with your life. This is usually the way it works. And I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with this approach, but I want to make sure you're doing so with intention and with an eye toward the future. And maybe, just maybe, you spend that one extra night thinking about what sport might be the best fit for your young son or young daughter. For all the reasons we talked about, and that little bit of reflection helps you make a decision that pays off for your child and you, hopefully, 10 years down the road. Unfortunately, the stakes have never been higher when it comes to the competitiveness in college admissions. And sports has become one of the few levers that can have outsized impact on your child's potential to get into highly selective colleges and maybe even score some scholarship money along the way. Every little bit counts these days, and I hope some of these insights help you along this journey. That's all I've got for you today, folks. 
Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the continued support. If you know a parent within 6th, 7th, 8th grader, ninth grader, 10th grader in high school that might find this helpful, please share the episode with them. You can do that by finding that small box with a tiny arrow pointing up. That's the share button. Click that button. Text your friends the link to this episode with a little personal note from you recommending that they give it a listen. Of course, if you have questions, comments, or an idea for an upcoming episode, please reach out to me by email, DM me on Instagram, prepwell underscore academy. Check out our blog, Facebook, or LinkedIn page. I'd love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by Prepwell Academy. Prepwell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week, every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to prepwellacademy.com and enroll your child today.